right, let's open our Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4. And this morning we finished up a series on the Ten Commandments. And this evening, this is... Uh, a possible introduction to another series. I never know how long uh, necessarily a series is going to last. On um, Wednesday nights, we've been going through the book of Revelation, and um, <clears throat> we are approaching the final chapters of that book, and things are moving along a little bit at a, at a faster pace there in that study, but um, we're at least going to have an introduction to a new series. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, and uh, maybe all we'll have of this series is the introduction if God changes uh, the, the plans on me, and sometimes he does, and sometimes uh, I know what I'm supposed to preach right now, and then that becomes a series, and sometimes it's that's that. I could, what I, I guess I'm trying to say is this could very easily become a series, but Deuteronomy 4, we'll read verses 5 through 9. Let's read these responsively. Uh, I'll begin with verse 5, and please read verses 6 and 8 out loud with me. <clears throat> the Bible says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall share all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest, that, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us tonight. I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would uh, meet with us, that he would speak through me, through the preaching of your word tonight. That those that are here and those that uh, uh, are not able to be here in person, but uh, they do uh, they do pull it up on the internet and watch there. I pray that uh, you would speak to all of us, that uh, your word would work its way in, not just into our hearts, but into our very lives. Give us opportunity and help us to take those opportunities to put into practice what we learn here tonight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There was a uh, a series of sermons I listened to several years ago. It's been oh, close to two and a half decades ago now that I listened to these series of, of messages. I've got a whole set of cassette tapes and they're very, very good, very well put together. One of the things the speaker mentioned is that generally when you take a census of a prison population, you have they categorize people into different groups. And by the way, this is something the world does, something that evolution teaches, is that there's all manner of different races. The fact of the matter is, there are not all manner of different races. There is the human race. And we come in, in different shapes and sizes and colors, but we're still human. Mm -hmm. and, and so at one time people thought, well, you, you can't take a blood transfusion from somebody of a different race. Well, there's not people of a different race. Uh, there may be different ethnicities or, or and, and see, you, you, you start going down that line and you arrive on that path, on that track by leaving the Bible truth out of things and, and accepting what the world is promoting and, and, and providing. And, and so, but anyways, they found that as far as the different ethnicities or groups of people, it seemed like one of the lowest represented groups of people in prisons were the Jews. And, and he, he went back into history and traced something that the Jewish people would do. And, and he said, historically, now it's not so much currently that this is done, 
but God said, if you follow my statutes, if you follow my rules and my laws and, and, and pursue after me, he said, that will have uh, effect upon generations, thousands down the line. And so the, the Jewish people are still reaping things that took place that were written here in Deuteronomy uh, and in the book of Exodus. Uh, <clears throat> granted, not every individual has followed that. And that's why there are some of them in prison. Um, but he said it was, it was a customary thing. Uh, of course, their Sabbath it was Saturday. And God said, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. They, they didn't have church on Saturday. They would have what we would call church. They had their, their religious instruction meeting took place what we would call Friday evening. It dismissed before six o'clock. The men would attend. The women and children would stay home. While the father, the man of the house, he attended, he, he listened, he received the instruction, the reading of, of God's word, uh, the instruction there. Then he would go home and the mom would have all the children lined up, washed and, and, and just ready for the, the return of dad. And he would come in and, and bless them. And then he would teach them what he had just learned at church for a better word, even though it wasn't church as we know it. Well, he had just learned in the synagogue uh, from the rabbi, from the teacher. And, and so the father took these things on. Now, it's interesting because we see here that the children of Israel, the, the book of Deuteronomy, is they're approaching their second arrival at the promised land. Remember the, the first time they showed up, uh, 12 men went to spy out Canaan. 10 were bad and two were good. <clears throat> and... Uh, so 10 brought an evil report against it. They voted. They voted against going in. And so God said, okay, you will not go in. Now, these two that voted for it, they're going to go in. Uh, but the rest of you, uh, you're going to spend 40 years just going in circles, wandering in the wilderness until this generation passes off of the scene and the young generation comes up and takes their place and that young generation will go in. Now, so this is the young generation. The, Deuteronomy, the word Deuteronomy means the second giving of the law. By the way, tonight it's going to be mostly teaching. And, and this series is going to be, if it is a series, it's going to be a lot of teaching. Uh, and, and so they had grown lax during the last 40 years. There was uh, uh, people that were adults now that were children when the book of Exodus took place. And they are not familiar with the words of the law. And so God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them to you all over again. And so everybody can be brought up to the same spot. And everything's fresh in everybody's mind. Some parents have been teaching their kids. Some parents have not. They didn't care. What did it matter to them? They weren't going to be alive to see the promised land. They weren't going to go in. So, so they just didn't bother. And, and so God said, I want everybody on the same page when you go in. And so these, these are rules for them to live by in the promised land. Now, they were supposed to practice living by them while they're out in the wilderness, but they're, they're about to go through a transition. Turn with me over to chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to look at, uh, start in verse 1. And it says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. So he said, all right, you're about to go into this land, the promised land, you're going to go possess that. This is the, the guidelines, these are the laws, these are the rules that God wants you to live by there. Verse 2, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son, and thy son's son all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Now I want us to take a look at how does this apply to us today? Guess what? Our kids are going to grow up. We were talking to, to Joy last night about Parker and how old he is, and she said, he's how old? And we told her again, she said, he's going to be driving soon. And that scared us. Uh, <laughs> and I'm sure it scares you now. <laughs> but so 
think about that. Soon, before you know it, your kids are going to be moving from completely under your roof to somewhere else. And it might happen that I heard somebody say that uh, their dad uh, uh, on their 18th birthday came, woke them up and said, happy birthday. Check out time is at noon. <laughs> and I think they were just kidding. The reason I think they were kidding is because they're a comedian. Um, but some people do that. Hey, you're 18, get out. And you're 18, here's what your rent is now. And if people want to charge their kids rent, that's that's up to them. But, uh, but anyhow, at some point, they're going to live somewhere else that's not where they grew up. And these people that are receiving the instruction in Deuteronomy are about to live somewhere where they did not grow up. So how do these things apply to us? Well, our kids are going to be reaching a point of transition to where they're somewhere else. And so we can learn some things, the instructions. That's why he says uh, you and your kids and your kids' kids. You, you get a hold of it yourself and teach it to your kids and teach it to your kids' kids. And the Jewish way was the father went and got the instruction and he came home and he instructed his wife and he instructed his children and he taught them. And then the boys grew up, they moved out of the house, they would go to synagogue and they would get the instruction. They would come home and they would teach their wife and their children and, and so on and so on and so on. And guess what? There's still a lot less of them in prison than people that have not had that practice. And I, I, I would challenge, see, our prison problems is not a social problem. It's not a government program problem. It is a spiritual problem. And if we went into the poor neighborhoods and implemented that one practice, well, our prisons would, in the next generation, be a lot emptier than what they are now. If we went into our wealthy neighborhoods and caused them to implement that one practice, because it's not just poor people that go to prison. If we went into the middle class neighborhoods and implemented that one practice, hey men, you're going to go to church, you're going to get some instruction, you're going to take that Bible home and you're going to teach your wife and you're going to teach your kids what God says. We're going to implement, we're going to put this in the educational system. Boy, when the Bibles were still being read in school, schools didn't have mass shootings. Right. Schools didn't have teen pregnancy to the to the point that they have it now. STDs running rampant, drug and alcohol abuse. Anyway, that's free. Where were we? We're in chapter six. Verse let's start in verse three. Let's pick up there. Hear, O Israel, hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily. Hey, by the way, who doesn't want their kids to go on and do better than what they themselves have done? And that's what they're saying. If you'll do these things, you will increase. You'll do better than what you have. Uh, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Verse 7, And Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on the gates and it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. Ye shall not go after other gods 
of the gods of the people which are round about you. Verse 12, I had some time ago underlined that word beware, and I wrote in the margin of my Bible, beware of prosperity. But I also want to write, I wrote this out earlier today, beware when you're in a land you haven't been in before. And when kids grow up and move out, they find themselves in a land they haven't been in before. It is a foreign land. If they go to Bible college, they've never, they've never lived in a dorm at a Bible college before. And people think, well, nothing bad will happen at Bible college. Kids still backslide in Bible college. Kids still do wrong. Kids get kicked out of Bible college. And it's not because they did all right and they obeyed all the rules. It's because they did some wrong things and had to be sent home. Now, some are sent home. You need to go home, spend the rest of the semester there, think over your life decisions. And if you've changed directions, call us back. And, and I know a young man got sent home from Bible, got kicked out and uh, spent the rest of the semester back home, came back the following semester, total change of attitude and change of direction in his life. And he's getting things on track. And boy, I'm excited about that. I pray for him regularly. But uh, what is happening is for the children of Israel, a transition is about to take place. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night is about to go away. Consider the security that that pillar provided the Israelites. The, the ones that are going into the promised land, they grew up with that. Now, some of them were, were kids and some of them were teenagers. When, when you know, they remember a time in Egypt when they didn't have it. And, but all through their growing up and formative years, they've had that security. If ever something happened, hey, it's, we're out here in the middle of the desert. All they had to do is look over towards the tabernacle and say, you know what? God is still with us and the evidence of his presence. Now, the cloud and the fire was not God, but it was evidence of his presence still with them. And they could find that just a, a comfort. in a, But they're getting ready to be in a land where they're not going to live in the same city where the tabernacle is. They're going to live spread out in different regions of the land. Different tribes receive different regions and different parts. And even if they did live in the same place where the tabernacle was going to be set up, the cloud and the fire is about to be gone. That safety net, that security, that comfort is about to go away. They are about to leave what they had called home for 40 years. And they were getting ready to enter into a new stage of life. The adults had never lived in such a place. The children had never lived in such a place. We look at the stages that they went through. They, they went through liberation from Egypt. We say salvation. Training. And now it's time for real life. These cities were established cities. The city of Jericho, the city of Ai, all these, these cities that houses that they did not build, they were already on somebody's map somewhere. See, cities are not cities under themselves. When you get to a certain size, trade routes develop. People from foreign lands come through peddling their wares. You get a city and hey, there's no copper around here, but there's copper in another city Hey, it'd be handy to have a copper pot. And somebody that knows where there's copper says, these people would like some copper pots. I'll go buy some copper pots and I'll put them on the back of my donkey and guide my donkey over here and sell them copper pots. What do y'all have over here? Well, we have this type of cloth. They like that type of cloth over there. And so trade routes start. And with that, People come through that have different belief systems and God is warning them, there's a danger that you're going to forget who I am. You're going to be confronted and faced with foreign gods. 
gods of other people with a with a small g instead of a capital G. And, and God said, they did not deliver you from the hands of the Egyptians. They did not feed you for 40 years in the wilderness. They did not sustain your shoes and your clothing and keep all that from wearing out. They did not deliver you from the hands of enemies and, and protect you and heal you from uh, from venomous uh, serpents and, and, and just one miracle after, and feed you and give you water and, and take care of you that whole time. And he said, if, if you're not careful, if you don't do something on purpose, you'll forget. If you don't do something on purpose, you'll forsake and you'll leave me away and then things will go badly for you. And so God says, Moses, get the people together and we're going to prepare them for what they're about to face. And so in verse 1 of chapter 6, it says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. So Moses gets everybody together. He says, What I'm about to tell you is everything that God ordered me to teach you. Why? Because you're about to go into houses you didn't build. You're about to go into an area you're not familiar with. You're about to be faced with things you haven't been faced with before. You're about to meet people you've never met before. People that were raised differently. People that don't believe in the true God. And when you do that, you're about to have a diet you're not accustomed to. You're about to enter into a land that flows with milk and honey, with grapes so big, one cluster it takes two people to carry. And since that's the case, he said, beware, lest thou forget the Lord. There's a tragic thing happening in Christianity. It's been happening for some time now. Kids grow up in church. Kids grow up maybe even in a Christian school, maybe homeschooled, and they leave the house and they leave God. And they spend years being beaten up and torn up by the world. Maybe to be spat out by the world to return to God. And God warned the Israelites, same thing will happen to you if you don't prepare for that transition. If you don't prepare for it. I've been looking at this and studying it and, and just kind of going over it in my mind from time to time for, for some time now. And one of the things that, that, I've, that I've found to be a problem is a few of the things I should say. One of the things is kids are leaving home without their own walk with God. They haven't had their own walk with God. Their parents have their walk with God, but kids haven't read their own Bible on their own learned things and gotten things heard from God on their own at all and so for them it's easy to leave something they never really had you know if, if, if I meet somebody and just say hi to them and I keep going I'm not heartbroken if I never see that person again in my life I never knew them never got close to them never had a relationship there was never a give and take of any kind with them and a lot of kids are graduating high school and that's their, they, they might be saved, but there's never been a relationship built. They met once and then they went their separate ways. They never really missed other than now they have a need for that relationship with God, but they don't have it. And so they, the devil says, uh, you have a need. Come over here. And it's, just, it's not even that he says, shop at my table. He slides the door of his van open. He says, come over here. I got what you want to buy. And that's where they go. And he's selling drugs and alcohol and, and uh, promiscuity and rock music and immodesty. And they, they buy it and they swallow. And it destroys them. Riotous living. 
and parents are heartbroken and preachers are heartbroken and Sunday school teachers are heartbroken and Christian family members are heartbroken and even unsaved family members are heartbroken at how, how deep they're going into depravity. So I think first of all, their own relationship with God is, is crucial. Second of all, they're being presented by some very authoritative sounding voices, falsehoods. And some people who are, are very convinced of their own fairy tale and presenting it as truth. Which I've never heard that before. I'm going to adopt that. I've never, I've never met that God before. I'm going to adopt him. And because they don't have a good understanding of their own God, of the true God, they go after false gods. So in verse 14 of chapter 6, God warns them, you shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. And they go after that religion of evolution. And they say, huh, never heard that. So Lord willing, we're going to spend some time in identifying and providing information for people that they can pass on to their own kids so that when their kids leave home and go into the world. I've heard that before. And no, carbon dating's not accurate. I've heard that before. And you're, you're, you're making a lot of assumptions. You know, in a court of law, at least on TV, I heard him say objection, assuming facts, not in evidence. And evolution is all about that. Right. They assume facts, not in evidence. That's right, preach. Oh, we've got, you say the world is only 6,000 years old, but we've got trees that are 10,000 years old. Does it have a label? We put out a garden last year, and my wife put these little stickers. These are cucumbers, these are carrots, and the little, little signs in the ground. Not stickers, but little, little signs that she had written on there. Carrots and zucchini and tomatoes, and so she knew Trees don't have a label of when they were planted. Well, we counted the rings. You are assuming one ring per year. That's not always the case. Right. There are some years where there are several rings that happen. And so you could have a tree that's, well, we have, we have these fossils. And fossils take millions of years to form. No, they don't. No, they don't. In the 80s, Mount St. Helens <coughs> erupted. Big mudslide. There are fossilized trees there now. And that was the 1980s. So within the last 40 years, fossils have formed. They formed in my lifetime. Well, you go to these caverns and boys and girls, these are stalactites. They're the ones that hang from the ceiling. And then these are stalagmites building up. From... These take millions of years to form. There are stalactites under the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. George Washington wasn't around millions of years ago. Just a couple hundred years. And they have formed there. And I could be, it's either the Washington Monument or the Lincoln Memorial. One of those two. They got tunnels underneath and, and there's stalactites that have formed there already. It does not take million. They're, they're assuming, well, this drop drops five drops an hour. There are this many particles of sediment in that drop, and that's how fast it's dropping now. That's how much sediment is in it now. How much sediment was in it 100 years ago? Well, I don't know. You're assuming it was the same amount 100 years ago. You can't assume that because you can't know that. Nobody measured it then. So it could be forming faster now. It could be forming slower now. We don't know. See, we as Christians look at the same evidence that evolutionists look at. We just have a different, we come at it from a different angle. If we were to walk into a room and see a glass on the table that was half full of water, we would say, somebody put a glass of water there. That's what we would assume. It did not happen by itself. But we don't know how long it's been sitting there. We don't know how full it was when it was first placed there. 
Maybe it was placed there a week or two ago and it was full at that time. We don't know. The evolutionists look at that glass of water and they say, wow, what an amazing feat of nature. <laughs> that evolved, that glass evolved out of wood and water evolved out of something <laughs> and poured itself into that glass. It all happened by itself. If you find a watch in a field, there has to have been a watchmaker at some point in time. Yep. Oh, a tornado passed through here and picked up minuscule parts of metal and plastic and glass and crystal and put them together. And now we dug up that, that watch. Millions and millions of years old. It took millions of years to make that watch. It did. So we'll look at some of the things, same evidence, but when we look at it from a biblical perspective, we can come to a different conclusion than if we refuse to allow the Bible to speak or even refuse to allow the evidence to speak for itself. They have to put in place a framework on top of the evidence to force the evidence into place. And we just allow the evidence to be there and say, you know what, that matches what I read here without me having to force it, mold it, manipulate it, or change it. And so kids leave home, they've never heard the other side. And when the other side is presented so authoritatively by people who are so educated, they release what little they had and embrace that and say, now I'm free to do whatever I want. And folks, freedom is not to do whatever we want. Freedom is to do what we ought. Mm -hmm. Let's stand tonight. We'll close with a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for calling the Israelites together before they transitioned into that new land and said, it's important for you to know I'm still your God. I'm the only God. And I want to have a relationship with you. It's important for you to know that even though you're going to be living somewhere else, the rules still apply. The expectations are still there. Right is right and wrong is still wrong. God, as we leave here tonight, I pray that your Holy Spirit would, would uh, take us, guide us, keep these truths in our minds and our hearts, help us to pass them on to the next generation and the one after that. I pray that you'll return us again at the appointed hour. Bless the services in the Bible study Wednesday. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you.